You know that a culture and a church is in trouble when it spends a great deal of time emphasizing family values. When the most successful religious programs are those that focus on the family, and when some of the most urgent political programs are those that try to uphold the value of the family, you know that things are in a pretty sorry state. Now you say, well, how can you say that? Shouldn't a church emphasize the family and shouldn't um, in the public life of a community and nation the family be honored and exalted? Well, yes, of course, um, the church should have healthy families and uh, culture should have solid family structures, but the fact that it even needs to be said and that it even needs to be emphasized is evidence that things are in a very difficult situation. Family values are not especially lofty. They are not especially unusual and extraordinary and virtuous and righteous and holy. Family values are just good, decent paganism. And so when we have churches that are desperately scrambling to save some shred of the family, and when many pastors among us would be just delighted if our congregations would behave the way Jesus said a pagan behaves, that is, by being nice to those who are nice to them, by parents being nice to kids and kids being nice to parents, um, and by getting along with the people who are part of your church, uh, that's what decent pagans do. They get along with their buddies, and they're nice to their family. And so we, we know that things are in a very difficult and indeed desperate condition when the church itself finds itself falling quite a ways short of what Jesus said good pagans are like. Jesus said, if you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who are good to you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners do that. If you greet only your brothers, what are you doing more than others? Do not even the pagans do that? Well, in our society, unfortunately, many of the pagans don't. And many of the followers of Jesus, or those who claim to be, don't. What Jesus said, now here's the condition and behavior of nice, normal sinners. Well, we can't even be nice, normal sinners anymore a great deal of the time. Um, I'll say a little more about that in a moment. There's a phrase in, in Paul's letter to Timothy where he says people are without natural affection, where they are without even normal family tie or natural affection, a characteristic of the last days when things are in a, an especially decayed state. Now, on the one hand, Jesus says you're not even a good pagan if you have family values. On the other hand, Jesus sounds like an outspoken enemy of family values. If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters and, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. You can't be Jesus' disciple if you don't hate everybody closest to you and hate yourself too. So, those are two sayings of Jesus. That if you're nice to your family, congratulations, you're almost there as a good pagan. And if you don't hate your family, you can't follow me. Before we even get into trying to grasp what he's saying, I think one thing can be said for sure. Jesus is not simply a teacher of good family values. There's something a lot different than ordinary, be nice to those who are nice to you, get along with your family, build up your family, what's good for your family. There's something a lot more or different to the life Jesus brings and the life he teaches than just that. Well, what is going on? Well, regarding hating your 
own family doesn't mean that you feel, you know, you're just disgusted with them. You can't stand them. You want the worst for them. You do everything you can to harm them. Well, not exactly. You have to take what Jesus says in line with other things that he says. He often says things with the strongest, in the strongest possible way to get your attention and to get you thinking about it. But if we think that it means that he wants us just to mess up our family and be mean to everybody that's close to us, obviously that's not what he means. Here's what he said in a conversation um, with some religious leaders. He said, Moses said, honor your father and your mother, but you say, if a man tells his father or his mother, whatever you would have gained from me is korban, that is, given to God, it's a gift to God. I, I know that, you know, normally you ought to help out an aging father and mother, but hey, I had to give it to God. Well, then you no longer permit him to do anything for his father or mother, thus making void the word of God by your tradition that you've handed down. So, again, Jesus says, now if you say that you're doing something for God, and that's why you're such a cheapskate with your parents, then you're nullifying God's command in order to follow your own dreamed-up version. And elsewhere in the Bible, it says if somebody doesn't provide for his relatives, and especially for his immediate family, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. So whatever we make of Jesus' words um, that we are to hate our family members, one thing it doesn't mean is that you're to have a really negative attitude toward them, that you are to neglect them, not care for them, not help them, and so on. Because according to the word of God, that is falling far short and being a lot worse than a pagan. And Jesus is calling us to be better than the pagans, to be better than a nice, decent sinner. So Jesus does want us to care for our families, to carry out our duties towards them. There have been some people um, who spoke of mission, and one of their slogans even was, if you do God's work, then God will look after your family. You didn't really want to see some of those families because that has often been an excuse. Now, there's one element, I suppose, that it's true. If you put God first, then God will do many things to take care of your family, but he will do some of it through you. If you put God first is an important phrase, but for many people who have been involved in ministry or in various things, what it really means is if you put your workaholic drive first and your desire to build some sort of kingdom, then God will make sure that things are okay with family. Well, it doesn't quite mean that. So one thing we want to be careful of as we hear these words of Jesus and as he gets our attention and kind of whacks us over the head with some very striking statements is that we don't want to be worse than the pagans worse than the unbelievers, where we don't even have natural affection or kindness towards those close to us. What does Jesus mean? Well, when he says that you need to hate those around you and even your own life, one thing he's saying is that nobody matters more than the commander. Nobody matters more than the general. If you want to join the military... You must hate father, mother, wife, children, and even your own life. Right? At one level, you must. If your commander says, you're going there, and you say, but I want to go home and be with my mama, you'll say, well, you joined the army. I'm not your mama. You're going where I sent you. Oh, I want to go home and cuddle with my sweetie. No, you got a mission this week, and you're going where you're commanded to go. And your mama might weep, and your sweetheart might weep, but you're going, and you're doing what hurts them, and you're choosing some other commander and some other cause above people whom you ordinarily are very attached to and love very much. When the army says, be all that you can be, uh, you know, in the old commercials, or you get these glamorous things in the military, the fact is, in order to join the military, you've got to hate your family at one level. That doesn't mean that it's evil to join the military. It does mean that once you make a certain kind of commitment, then you're going to go where you're sent, when you're sent, and you're going to follow those orders if it means your family is heartbroken at you being halfway around the world, if it means that you could be shot and killed and lose your own life and they might lose you. 
And that is what Jesus is saying. If you want to follow me, I am the general. And you may have other people in your life whom you love very much, but when I give an order, that comes before everything and everybody else, no matter how close they are to you. And don't think I came to bring peace on earth. I came not to bring peace, but a sword. I am here to invade and take back my territory. And as I do that, it's going to bring division within families where some are going to be against me and some are going to be for me. And that means some are going to be against each other. It's going to bring division. It's going to bring difficulty. It's going to bring hardship. But I'm here on a campaign. And you cannot follow me and join my campaign unless you realize and are willing to pay the cost that it might mean that sometimes you are going to have to go against the tug of your heart and the natural affections that you have in order to follow me and to obey my orders. If your son will not walk the way of Christ, then you must follow the way of Christ, even if it means it alienates your very own son from you. If your parents are mad when you convert to following the Lord Jesus Christ, then at one level you must hate your parents in order to follow Christ. That doesn't mean, as we just saw earlier, that you feel this disgust and despising and wishing the worst for your parents and always have a bad attitude. It means that when push comes to shove, you follow Jesus and nobody else. Nobody matters more than the general. And nothing matters more than the banquet. Again, one of the great temptations of traditional family values and of domestic life is that it is so comfy and in some cases so enjoyable. If you have a good love life with your wife, if you enjoy being with your kids, if the paycheck is decent and home life is stable and pretty happy, you just wish it could go on forever just the way it is. Who needs that banquet? <laughs> I'm already feasting very well, thank you. I just married a wife. No can do for the banquet. Uh, the five oxen are pulling very nicely, providing well for the family. We've got a nice family farm. We've always dreamed of a place in the country. Um, here we've got it. And so with one accord, they began to make excuse. And they are so happy with what they got that they don't want, and they don't even realize what they're missing out on. There are more than one version of worldliness. We sometimes say worldliness is when you're watching TV shows or movies or listening to music that you shouldn't. And, yeah, that's a form of worldliness when you're just accepting all kinds of garbage that the world pumps in. But another form of worldliness, says Jesus, is this. They were marrying and giving in marriage right until... The flood came and took them all away. It doesn't say they were listening to bad. I mean, there was violence in the earth. There was a lot of bad stuff going on before the flood. But Jesus says, hey, they were marrying and giving marriage and kind of going on with business as usual. And that, that can be a very great danger. One way to be worldly is to be degenerate and a lousy person who is worse than what Jesus says is a nice, decent pagan. But another way to be worldly is just to be content with a nice, comfortable animal life. I grew up on a farm. You know what? Cows like their calves, and calves like their mothers. When that baby is born, the cow will lick it, the calf will nurse, and those two are great buds. You don't have to be a Christian to love your kids. A cow can do that. Now, that, that may sound very crass, but it's true. I mean, it is part of just the physical, animal way that God has made us. This bodily, almost natural affection that exists among creatures that God has formed. But let's be honest. You do not have extraordinary, supernatural kinds of love flowing through you when you have managed to love the way a cow does. Nothing matters more than the banquet. The Bible speaks of people whose God is their belly, whose mind is on earthly things. Our citizenship is in heaven. And so there is a difference between those who live for the coming feast and for the kingdom of God 
and those who, if only they could have life the way they wish, if they could marry the right person, have the right kind of kids, have a pretty good income and a fairly stable life, now, they'd have it all. Sometimes we call that having it all. No, it's not. Having it all is having God and the kingdom of God. And so when Jesus speaks of hating family life, one thing it means is that nobody's more important than the general when the orders go out. You follow him. And another thing, when you're invited to his eternal banquet, then you run for it and you want it. And you don't say, oh, I'm just happy with the way things are. Another thing that it means is that we love and show mercy the way God does. How do you go beyond family values? By being like God because you've discovered what God is like towards you. Love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. If you love those who love you, <laughs> what credit is that to you? Even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who are good to you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners do that, but love your enemies. Do good to them. Then your reward will be great and you will be sons of the Most High because he's kind to the ungrateful and wicked. Be merciful as your Father is merciful. This is where we're carried far, far beyond family values. One of the most terrible expressions of family values in the 20th century was Nazism. Ein Volk, ein Reich, ein Führer, one people or family. And those who aren't part of that family, that's, that's what happens when you idolize family and clan to the extreme. It's called racism or just hatred of those who are different and an attempt to wipe them out. On the flip side is Jesus' direction to love enemies because you understand what God is like. What is God like? Well, every morning the sun comes up and do its warming, life-giving rays only land on the good people and those who kept their nose clean yesterday? No. He makes his sun rise on the evil and the good. He sends rain like the beautiful rains we had yesterday and last night. Did they only land on the lawns of the good people and nourish um, the places where the nice folks live? No. Um, that rain fell on a lot of different kinds of places and on a lot of different kinds of people. Your creator is generous. And he pours out all kinds of good stuff on people who have been behaving fairly well lately and on many who haven't. If you just see how God runs creation, you see how generous he is. And if you go beyond that and you see how God behaves towards us in Jesus Christ and in spreading around his salvation, then you see even more. We see our Lord Jesus Christ and sinners are drawn to him because they find that he loves them and that he changes their life. The notorious sinners and the prostitutes are flocking to him, and the good folks don't really want that much to do with him because they don't want to hang around with those bad people that he hangs around with. But Jesus is showing what God is like because he is God, and he's doing what God does in loving the sinners and in loving the lost and the last and the least. And he, when we know him, and when he lives in us, will make us into people who love like he does and who have the kind of love and mercy that our Father in heaven does. Be merciful just as your Father is merciful. This is the key. It's not say, hearing just the words and saying, yeah, you know, there's the nice, decent pagans over there, and then there's the really bad, bad, bad degenerates over there, and we don't want to be the really bad, bad degenerates who are rude and crude and nasty to our family, and we don't want to just be like good, decent pagans. We want to rise to a level where we're the spiritual superstars, where we go above and beyond everybody else. Now, there's one sense, and yeah, we are called to go above and beyond everybody else, but not because we heard somebody just say, now give it a good oomph and try a little harder and you can sail beyond what the normal pagans do. No, Jesus says, this is what your father is like. If you're his kid, then his life is in you and he's changing you. If you're my disciple, you 
have experienced my love, and I've loved you when you weren't so great, to put it mildly. And so to have love and mercy like God's, we need to be what God is like. Now, sometimes this is very practical, and it must be said this is not very new. At the time Jesus was teaching, there were teachers and scribes and officials of the law who said that you should love your neighbor and hate your enemy. And Jesus says, well, I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Now, was Jesus coming along with a brand new thing that had never before been taught? No. He said, now I'm going to clarify you. I'm going to clarify for you, show you what it meant all along. You think that the law said you should love your neighbor, because it said love your neighbor as yourself, and then hate your enemy? Well, you ought to read the law a little more closely. It says love your enemy. Look at Exodus 23. If you meet your enemy's ox or his donkey going astray, you shall bring it back to him. If you see the donkey of one who hates you lying down under its burden, you shall refrain from leaving him with it. You shall rescue it with him. Now, again... Love does not mean, in the cockles of my heart, I feel great warmth for this person. They're just such a peach of a guy, and I really enjoy his company. And um, there, If you love your enemy, it does not mean you pretend that he's not your enemy. That, that he doesn't, you recognize he doesn't like you. And you may be even recognize, I don't really enjoy his company that terribly much. But when I see... His donkey over there, I don't say, ha, <laughs> serves him right. I hope that sucker, you know, wanders off another hundred miles and never finds that thing again. You see him carrying the burden, and he's trying to oomph and help his old donkey back up again, and you say, <laughs> boy, I, I hope that donkey dies right on the spot, or I hope he gets a hernia trying to help it back up again. Well, no. Um, the way that you love your enemies is you do what you would do for them, even if they were your friends. You just show them kindness. You give them help. You pray for them. You seek the best for them, even if they don't like you. And maybe even if you don't like them. You, know, you don't have to enjoy everybody's company all the time. Some people aren't much fun to be with. Maybe it's just because you're not com very compatible or you rub each other the wrong way. That may be, be that as it may. When the donkey's got a problem, you help with that donkey. <laughs> you, you show love by your actions and not just by working to try to get a little more positive emotion towards the other person. At any rate, Jesus says you love your enemies. And he's not telling us something brand new that God had never told anybody before. You love your enemies because what has God done? Well, God has done that for you. Now again, going back to the theme of of being nice, decent sinners or good, respectable pagans. Really, at one level, it's just sensible self-interest, isn't it? Why should you honor your father and your mother? So that you don't mess up your life and so that you don't wreck everything. If you enter adulthood with a whole pile of baggage on your shoulders where you can't stand your dad and, you've, and you're angry about this or you're ticked off with your mom, it'll, it'll poison you. It'll cause strains and difficulties maybe for the rest of your life. If you want things to go well with you and to live long in the land the Lord your God is giving you, um, seek to honor mom and dad. And your husbands. Should you love your wife because, you know, it's just some grand heroic achievement where you're just doing something fantastic um, and, and amazing? Well, husbands should love their wives as their own body. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it. Let each of you love his wife as himself. You have blockhead? You know, if you're mean to your wife, you're just hurting yourself. What kind of knucklehead are you? you know, you're not rising to the great peaks of virtue and nobility by being kind to your wife. If your wife is happy, you're going to be happier. Okay? <laughs> That's all it's saying. The two shall be one flesh. If something bad happens to your spouse, it ain't going to be fun for you. Okay? That was simple. <laughs> That's what the Bible's saying. Now, the Bible also in this very passage says it goes a lot way beyond that because 
Husbands, you should lay down your lives as Christ did, lay down your life for your wife as Christ did for the church. But hey, there's this bare minimum where you, if you're kind to your wife, you're just loving yourself. And marriage is, me is meant to show far more than just self-love. But even at the level of self-love, it's just common sense. If you want to be happier, be nice to your kids. They'll probably be nicer to you in return. If you want to be happier, be nice to your spouse. They'll probably be nicer back. Makes a lot of sense. If you want to live in a society that's um, without family values, that's basically suicidal, suicidal stupidity, without natural affection. What's going on in an age when there's so much division between generations and so much animosity even between family members? Well, it means that we live in a very individualistic, uh, individualistic is the big, long, nice-sounding word for being a selfish pig, but we live in an individualistic, self-centered generation where we're blind to the fact that a great deal of our just basic day-to-day -day happiness depends on strong, stable relationships. And traditional values provide the network and the setting for just a richer and more secure life and for those stable relationships. And hey, it's a way of getting your genes and your ideas and your culture to live on after you. If you're just a nice, self-centered, kind of Darwinist person and you want something of you to survive in this world, one way to do it is through traditional family values. Your genes survive. Some of your ideas survive as you teach them to your kids. Some of the culture that you were part of survives. And yeah, that's kind of nice. And if you're such a blockhead that you have no value at all on, on your own identity and on your own culture, well, that's the way of cultural suicide. That's the way a good deal of the West is going, but it's not very bright. Extreme individualism just follows immediate impulse. It ruins your relationships that you need for a comfortable, happy life. Sometimes we, if you studied philosophy at all, you maybe have heard of a guy named Epicurus. Epicurus is sometimes associated with just living for pleasure and doing whatever you feel like, because Epicurus was an atheist, and Epicurus um, wanted to maximize pleasure in life. But even Epicurus wasn't stupid enough to be an Epicurean. Epicurus said, you know, if you want the maximum pleasure and the minimum pain in life, then you got to be moderate. you got to get along with people. you got to observe certain kinds of values, and that's how you live. <laughs> so... He was smart enough to realize that you don't just do whatever you feel like in the moment because it brings way too much long-term pain. So um, that just the kind of individualism that is so rampant in our own culture isn't just sinful. It's kind of stupid, and it's kind of sick, and, it, and it's suicidal. Now, having said all those unflattering things, the fact is God loves people who are stupid and sick and suicidal. And that very often it is the very champions of family values who have the hardest time hearing the voice of Jesus because their ears are stuffed with their own righteousness and their hearts are stuffed with all the goodies they've managed to accumulate by semi-decent pagan living accompanied by God's sunshine and rain. Does God love only those who love him? Does he help only those who deserve it? Does he give only to those who can repay him? You know the answer to that. God is kind to the ungrateful and to the wicked. And he shows his love for us, not just in creation, but then also in his behavior in Christ. In that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. While we were still his enemies. And so in one sense, the gospel is a far more demanding message than the message of nice paganism and good, decent sinnerism. But on the other hand, it's also a way better message of salvation for those who have sunk very far. Because it means that no matter how good you've been in your nice, decent paganism, you're not nearly good enough to measure up to the standards of God. You can be considered by the world a fairly nice, good person, and you can be a totally self-centered pig who's doing it all just because it works out nicely for you. The bad news is that you can be practicing family values and widely admired and be right on the highway to hell. The good news is you can be one big stinker and your life can be a disaster and you can be wrecking the lives of nearly everybody around you and you are not a lost cause if you run into Jesus Christ.
because that's just the way he is. What he touches doesn't corrupt him. Instead, what he touches, he changes, and he forgives, and he transforms, and he acquaints you with a Father in heaven who is merciful to those who need mercy, who's gracious to those who need grace. And so when you taste that God grace-based love, then you begin to share that kind of grace-based love with others. And hey, it's Hospitality Sunday. Um, I hope you invited somebody over. But we could go beyond pagan hospitality. If you did have somebody over who's kind of a bud anyway or somebody from our church, well, congrats. You know, we're, we're doing good family of faith pagan hospitality today. Um, when you give a luncheon or dinner, don't invite your friends, your brothers or relatives, or your rich neighbors. If you do, they may invite you back. Oh, man, would that be bad? And then you'd be repaid. But when you give a banquet, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you'll be blessed. Although they cannot repay you, you'll be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. Now, once again, it just makes sense to have a certain level of hospitality. If you go out for a business lunch with somebody that you're hoping to get an account with, or somebody you've already got an account with and you're just going to kind of enjoy their company and keep the account going, do you say afterward, I have done a great and noble deed today? <laughs> no, you just did something that probably fat in your bank account. If you go out for supper with your wife, do you say to yourself, boy, I really am quite a husband. I did something heroic tonight. I took her out for steak, and I had a T-bone myself, too. Well, it's nice that you had a good time together, and I'm glad you liked the T-bone, but this was not one of the supreme achievements in human virtue. Your wife can repay you. Your business associates can repay you. If you have somebody over today from our church, they might even have you back and serve you something better than you served them. It's a possibility. If you really want a good chance to be a person like Jesus and maybe get a few extra rewards when you get to heaven, look for somebody who can't have you back. Look for somebody who is very needy, who has a very difficult time. Have them over. I sometimes am encouraged and inspired by my parents' example. Um, my parents sometimes give loans to people. I, I laugh as I say the word loans <laughs> because some of the folks they give loans to, they know as they give the loan that that money is gone. It is vamoosed. <laughs> they will never see one red cent of it again, but they call it a loan because the person evidently feels a little better about it. Well, the, well Jesus says that's you, you give to those that you really can't expect much in return from because, because they can pay you back? No, just because they need help. You love people just because you have the love of God in you and because they need it. That's how God loves. Does God love that one sheep out of the hundred more than he loves the 99? Well, in one sense, in only one sense, yes, because they need his help so much more. It's not their virtue that calls forth his love. It's their need that calls forth his love. And because God is the great God of grace, his love chases whoever needs it the most. And our love, too, should be chasing those who need it, not just those who are comfortable, and who are going to pay it back to us. So, here's values religion. If you ask what's in it for me, it makes sense to love those who love you, to follow traditional values, to be involved in a religion that helps to maintain these things. Go to a church that builds up families and strengthens family values. And if the family that prays together stays together, well, then by all means pray. Pray. Have family devotions. Do it together, and you'll more likely have a healthy family. And in business, if honesty is the best policy, well, then be honest and embrace a religion that teaches honesty and that may even give you a little bit more of a reputation for being honest. You know, if people know that you go to church, that might help you in some circles. So, values religion can pay now. It can make your family better. It can make your business life better. It can help your bank account. And it is not 
the religion of Jesus Christ. The religion of Jesus is more and different than that. It does not destroy that. I mean, all of this is true. <laughs> this is all true. It's just not enough. What's in it for me is never the best, <laughs> never the best question to ask when you're trying to find out what God is like and what truth is. You have to ask the question of Jesus, how are you different? How are you different from pagans? Well, one way to answer that is just self-denial. You deny yourself in relationship to God. When it comes to God, you don't come into God's presence and offer yourself as the reason why he should approve and accept you. You don't say, God, look at me. Look at my behavior. Look at my good heart. Look at what I've made of myself. I've tried hard, and I'm sure that you're impressed. No, if, if you want to come to God at all by the path Jesus commends, you say, Lord, I consider everything that I am and have achieved as rubbish in terms of its value in earning your approval. I come to you with empty hands and a corrupt heart, and I ask you to give me a new heart and to fill my emptiness with your fullness. Jesus says, blessed are those who are poor in spirit. Blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are those who are meek, who hunger and thirst for righteousness. They're the ones who are blessed. And why? Because they're denying their own righteousness. They're denying that their own spirits are the way they ought to be. And they are saying, God, I just throw myself on you as the God of grace who takes me the way I am and welcomes me. And you deny yourself in relating to others. Instead of just looking out for your own self-interest, you look out for the interests of others. And you do what will help them. And in denying yourself, the irony is that all of a sudden you find your true self. You became who you were meant to be, who God designed you to be. And you find that you are the child of a great father of love. And that you are an ambassador and a channel of his great love to others. And then you begin to love freely the way your father loves. And he loves who? He loves evil people, like me. He loves helpless people. And so I look around for evil people to love and helpless people to help. And then there is at least a little of my father's resemblance in me. Then there is at least a little, a small step or two where I'm walking on the path behind my Savior. Lord, teach us to be people of grace. Help us, Lord, above all, simply to know you and the kind of God you are, the kind of lover and gracious and wonderful being that you are, and to be embraced and satisfied in that grace and love and mercy, and then to overflow with it as we relate to others. Lord, help us to crucify the old self, the fallen self, and to come alive through Jesus Christ to a new way of being, a way of being, Lord, that goes beyond just good traditional behavior and that, that values all those things and sees the wonder of family and um, the wisdom of good, stable relationships, but also, Lord, seeks to be like you in pouring grace and more grace and more grace into the lives of others. Help us, Lord, to live in that grace where our families, Lord, fall far short even of decent paganism. Forgive us and restore us and renew us and lift us up. And, Lord, where we've become complacent and self-satisfied in being nice, decent pagans, lift us again into the renewed awareness of your amazing grace and love. And then make us ambassadors of that grace and love. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.